So on 347, halfway down the page, the book writes, uh, human beings and nature are interdependent. Humans take food, air, water, and raw materials from the natural environment and deposit waste in it. Each generation receives the environment as a legacy from preceding generations and will in turn pass it on to their children. As noted, sustainable development takes place when the responsibility towards future generations is borne in mind and people act as stewards of natural resources. Okay, and there are different models or different approaches to how to accomplish this ideal of sustainable development. Okay, like I said, basically everybody agrees that in order to have an adequate, appropriate relationship with the environment, business needs to take some measures of preservation and protection. But since environmental concerns often actually are pretty opposed to industrial development or to technological development, some degree of wisdom here is necessary. And there are differences of opinion when it comes to actual theoretical models for conceiving of the relationship that business should take towards the environment. Okay, and if you'll look at uh, the the, turn the page in the text and look on page 348, and then I'm going to direct our attention to the different models that are presented on 349. I think that this will become apparent. Okay, uh, the idea of preserving and protecting the environment has always been present in the Christian philosophical tradition, but it has really only become acutely important in the sense that we conceive of it today in the second half of the 20th century as humans' industrial expansion became so great that we actually started becoming capable of doing real harm to our environmental surroundings due to carbon buildup, due to various toxic wastes and other chemicals that we were producing. Okay, and for that reason, the idea uh, that there should be a special field devoted to the topic of business and the environment kind of exploded onto the scene. And it's still a work in progress, and the models that I'm going to talk about momentarily are all still works in progress that uh, there are differences of opinion on. For the bottom of page 348, uh, we see the text writing, uh, after the pioneering discussions, the philosophical debate branched off into two main directions, one centered on ethical obligations regarding non-human beings, and above all, our responsibilities to future generations. Another view, more controversial, held that we have obligations to nature, not only regarding nature. Okay, obligations to nature can include animals and even trees and mountains, which would be seen as the bearers of legal rights. All right, um, I want to point our attention, first of all, to a view that is, I would say, is dominant in contemporary business. And that's the uh, dominative anthropocentrism view. Okay, and this is the first view that we're going to explicate uh, as, our, as a philosophically robust understanding of the relationship between business and the environment. Although I generally am not a fan of this view, I do want to say on its behalf, this is a very respectable view that has serious philosophical chops and goes all the way back in the tradition. Okay, uh, but just to read the book's quick summary uh, passage, this approach takes the human being as not only being at the center of the universe, but also possessing an absolute right to dominate any non-human creature on the planet. Human individuals are seen as autonomous beings endowed with knowledge and the power to dominate the earth for their own use and the nearly unlimited right to do so. This approach has been prevalent in business for years supported by the belief that the technological impact on nature uh, could be easily absorbed and by a cultural context in favor of the accumulation of wealth and an immoderate consumerism. Okay, at the heart of the anthropocentrism view is just the idea that it's human beings who matter the most. Okay, the hardline anthropocentrists say human beings matter, uh, human beings are the only thing that matters. Others, a weaker version of the view says that human beings are the thing that is most important. At any rate, though, from an anthropocentric perspective, the way you should approach decisions of business and the environment is always by wondering what will be the impact on humans. Will humans be benefited or will humans be damaged by this decision? And this is a very respectable view. It goes back to Aristotle, Aristotle's assertion that human beings as rational animals are 
special and hold a privileged place in nature because we have certain capacities that no other creatures have. Okay, so it is a very respectable philosophical view. Uh, if you take a case study that we had earlier this semester, like the, the Shell Brent Sparbui affair, which became so famous, in that situation, the decision whether or not to sink the buoy to the bottom of the ocean is a decision that should turn on the question of whether human beings would be negatively impacted by uh, doing so. If you can sink it to the bottom of the ocean without really harming any fisheries, without really harming any other human-related aspects of the ocean, then on the anthropocentric view, almost certainly the cost savings of doing so would justify a policy of sinking it because you can use the cost savings for other profitable measures. Okay, the anthropocentric view is a view that is widely held in business, and here I'm going to say some critical things about it because I think it is very much in business's self interests to hold this view. Okay, it is a philosophically respectable view, without a doubt, it's got serious chops and is worthy of respect. But human beings also often hold the views that they hold when it comes to fundamental issues because it is in their self-interest to hold those views. Okay, maybe it is in your self-interest to hold a view of the environment that will maximize your profits. And so you do so. You, you search around for a view that looks as though it will justify that kind of a stance. And anthropocentrism tends to lead to much uh, more business-friendly kinds of outcomes when it comes to clashes with environmental preservation and protection. And for that reason, it's a very popular view among business persons. Uh, questions about this view before we turn to another couple of views? Okay, everybody awake after the weekend? Somewhat. Boy, my kids weren't this morning. I take my five-year-old into school and drop her off, and the three-year-old uh, sleeps in the same room with her, and both of them were just basket cases this morning, poor little things. I, I have to make it easy on them. You know, I'm an indulgent father and all, but part of me wanted to tell them this morning, you know, it's going to be this way until 18. Like, you realize that. There's no choice. You're going to be getting up early in the morning and doing this with Daddy every morning until you're 18. But I refrained. They seemed as though they couldn't handle something that serious. The biocentric view on page 350 is a view that has been increasing in popularity. But it's not a view that's really held very often in business because it generally doesn't help uh, promote businesses self-interest but it is a view that is widespread in the culture and often you'll find it as a view among the opponents of business okay so it's a view that is especially held among younger people what is the view well the view is this in stark contrast to the previous view in biocentrism human beings are not considered the center of the world instead what is central is life any kind of life this is what biocentrism means. This position holds that all life forms not only possess intrinsic value, but are also equally valuable. And human beings are merely one animal species coexisting with others without any particular dignity to give them preeminence over other animals. In consequence, the well-being of all life must be taken into consideration. Okay, this is a view, like I said, that is increasingly popular these days. Um, it's a view that is hard to reconcile with uh, Christian teaching. So the, the anthropocentrism view is kind of a, a, an offshoot of Christian teaching about human specialness, because obviously in Christian doctrine, humans being made in the image of God with the Imago Dei are a special kind of creation. So the anthropocentrism view is kind of an offshoot and bears some resemblance to classic Christian teaching on these topics. But the biocentric view does not, okay? because the biocentric view asserts that all species are equal. okay? And what matters when it comes to preserving and protecting the environment is 
doing whatever will maximize the welfare of life. Okay, that means humans, that means other kinds of conscious beings. Because on the biocentric view, there is no distinction in kind between us and between the rest of the living beings in the natural world. And the philosophical basis for this varies. One version of it, for instance, is the idea that uh, respect for a particular living being should be based on whether that living being can experience pleasure or pain. Okay, and this is, again, this is very philosophically respectable, but um, it is a view that uh, leads to some interesting conclusions. Okay, so if a being can experience pain on the biocentric view, then that being is worthy of respect and preservation. Okay, and this is attractive to advocates of the biocentric view because all humans and a lot of non-human species can experience pain, but not all humans have rational capacities. Okay, so not all humans are capable of higher order thinking, the kind of philosophical justification that lies at the back of the anthropocentrism model. Okay, and certainly this is something, the uh, experience of pleasure and pain that we do hold in common with other species. The ecocentrism view is in contrast to the biocentrism view in certain ways, but in other ways it's, it resembles it very much. Like the biocentrism view, ecocentrism tends to knock humans down a peg and conceive of humans as not in a way that doesn't make humans the center of things when it comes to environmental topics. Here the center of life itself, I'm sorry, here the center is not life itself, but the ecosystem or complete community of living organisms and the non-living materials of their surroundings functioning together as a unity. Humans, as with animals, are part of a complex ecosystem. While biocentrism concentrates on protecting the life of individual animals, ecocentrism focuses on the whole. From this perspective, environmental ethics consists of achieving an equilibrium of natural ecosystems. Thus, protecting a specific animal is not acceptable if this leads to serious ecological damage. Okay, so this view, in certain ways, like I said, is like biocentrism in that it conceives of humans as being uh, on par with everything else, but it's not like biocentrism in some other very serious matters. So ecocentrism says, look, what matters is not individual beings. What matters is not the capacity for pleasure and pain or, or the experience of consciousness. What matters is that the ecosystem as a whole be a healthy thing. And so if a particular individual species is doing damage to the ecosystem as a whole, on, on ecocentrism, that species may justifiably be offed or, or reduced or, or in some other way harmed for the sake of the preservation of the ecosystem as a whole. If you are a park ranger and an invasive species of plant or an invasive species of animal like a, a, an invasive goat or an invasive um, a predator is in your park and this is harming other aspects of the ecosystem, then you may justifiably on ecocentrism shoot the goat, cut the plant down, various other measures for the sake of the welfare of the ecosystem as a whole. Okay, ecocentrism runs into certain difficulties, though, because it makes certain assumptions about human beings' capacity for understanding what is good for the environment. Okay, so for instance, uh, one of the problems that ecocentrism runs into is that it seems to assume that human beings can discern what is best for the environment, okay, which is not clear at all. It seems to assume that we 
have the capacity to look out at the world and to recognize when stuff is going wrong or out of equilibrium in the ecosystem and to and then that we are justified in interfering in that ecosystem for the sake of what we discern to be the best thing for it. Okay, and a lot of critics would say that this is actually very presumptuous to think that human beings can know what is best for the ecosystem. Still another problem with ecocentrism is that it seems to assume, at least in a lot of its variants, that the good for the environment is whatever is right now. Okay, this good is the stable, as opposed to whatever unfolds or develops. But of course, we know from history, and uh, whether or not you are a, a theistic evolutionist, I, I happen to be a theistic evolutionist, you know from looking at the historical circumstances that environments change all the time. Speciation happens, all sorts of changes occur. And to assume that the stable or the existing is the good can again be a presumptuous assumption because ecosystem tends to lead to attempts to uh, preserve and protect whatever currently exists. Okay, um, I should mention one other uh, thing. I'm gonna back up for just a minute. I forgot to mention this as a criticism of biocentrism. Go back to you, include this in your biocentrism notes. So those are two criticisms of ecocentrism. One, it uh, perhaps falsely assumes that we know what is best for the environment, and two, it perhaps falsely assumes that uh, whatever is stable or existing in the environment is justified. But let me back up to a quick criticism of biocentrism. Biocentrism in asserting that the point of environmental preservation and protection is the preservation and protection of life. In most of its variants, it has some sort of a, it builds in some sort of an assumption that there are morals that can be found in the natural world and that the preservation and protection of life is a morally upright thing. Okay, now certainly that's something that seems to be the case for humans without a doubt. Okay, I would, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm a Christian ethicist, and I would say that the preservation and protection of human life is always a, a justifiable thing. And to some extent, I would actually agree that it is justifiable as well for non-human species. But if you actually look out into nature, the idea of morality, morality as a phenomenon, is a human thing. It doesn't seem to exist outside of us. Okay, it's not as though the animals feel a moral sense. Um, it's not as though the lions feel remorse about eating the antelope. Okay, you guys remember that scene in is it Finding Nemo where the sharks get together and say, fish are friends, <laughs> not food? Okay, real funny scene, great movie. Okay, the lions don't get together in a therapy group and wonder, you know, should we really be eating innocent antelope? This is not something that enters their consciousness. It's morality is a human phenomenon. It's not as though the natural world feels this to be the case. Okay, and so one criticism of the biocentrism view is that it is imposing upon a non-moral order, moral ideals that only humans experience. Okay, arguably, that is a criticism. Okay, so uh, let me stop again. Questions or comments about anthropocentrism, biocentrism, or ecocentrism? Please ask a question. It's fine if we're all good. Cool, cool. Okay, let's look at one more view. Again, we're still in theory land, so we will do a case study momentarily. But let's look at one more view. This is the stewardship view. This is the uh, standard mainstream Christian view. 
And on this view, uh, human beings are the center of things. Okay, but on the stewardship view, humans being the most important thing when it comes to moral clashes with the environment are not the most important thing for their own sake. Rather, humans are the most important thing because of our status or role as stewards. Okay, uh, let me just read from the book. Okay, um, while dominative anthropocentrism has been the target of increasing criticism, other philosophical perspectives argue in favor of anthropocentrism with a human face. Along these lines, stewardship anthropocentrism, or simply stewardship, is a philosophy based on the idea that humans transcend nature but should act as stewards of it. Humans in this view are the central fact of Earth, and only they possess dignity and authentic rights. Okay, um, on the stewardship view, humans have been tasked with a role. Okay, and I hold this view, this happens to be my view of the proper relationship between business and the environment. And I'm a theistic proponent of this view. You can have a non-theistic version of the stewardship view. Maybe nature tasks people with a role. But on my, my version of this view, God has tasked human beings with the role of being stewards of preserving and protecting the earth. Okay, and the job of a steward, of course, is to improve the lands that the Lord has left him with, the noble has left him with. And so the job of a steward is to do fiduciary duties with regard to the natural world, at least in this case. Uh, which means that human beings, having been tasked with response, having been given responsibility for the world, are supposed to improve it. Supposed to do our best to preserve and protect and facilitate its flourishing. Okay, so the stewardship view then says that humans are really important, but it's not just for our own sake, for self-centered reasons. Rather, humans are really important, and the most important thing when it comes to environmental issues, so that we can be successful stewards of the natural order. Okay, it's kind of an outward-facing or selfless version of anthropocentrism. Human beings are the most important thing when it comes to business environment clashes, but not so that we can spoil the, spoil the natural order, not so that we can destroy a wetland or a forest, rather so that we can preserve and protect the environment, as a steward would do. Sometimes you'll uh, encounter twisted versions of uh, Christian stewardship teaching. Okay, stewardship is present all throughout the Christian scriptures, but sometimes you'll encounter twisted versions. Uh, one, one version that I think is uh, a pretty clear-cut twisted version is dominionism. Dominionism says that God has given us dominion over the natural order, and this means it is ours to do with as we please while we are here, and that means we can destroy it if we so choose, if it increases or expands our own welfare, our well-being. You know, if it will expand your profits, you may be justified in doing so. Okay, and I think that dominionism gets right the idea that God has uh, placed us in a special role. I think that what it gets wrong is the idea that we are actually the owners of the natural order. Okay, uh, I think that it's pretty clear from the Christian scriptures that the natural order, having been created by God, is God's. And we as human beings are tasked with local responsibilities to improve it, but it doesn't belong to us. It is temporarily ours to keep as stewards. And so I think that the dominionist view um, makes a mistake about that. Again, you can hold a, the a non-theistic version of the stewardship view. On non-theistic versions of the stewardship view, it is nature that has tasked us with being stewards. Okay, and we have responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis nature. Okay, um, let me stop and ask again if there are questions about the stewardship view. We're still in theory land today. Okay, I want to mention one other thing before we go to our case study. 
And this comes out of the biocentric perspective, but it kind of applies to, uh, to all of these views. And that's the uh, place of those beings that seem to be closest to us in ethical status, okay? Especially higher order animals. This is in the middle of page 351. One immediate consequence of the above mentioned approaches to environmental ethics is the consideration given to animals in each. Some in line with biocentrism proclaim that animals have rights or even demand animal liberation. Okay, um, this position would prevent using animals for food or clothing or for testing new drugs or other scientific research. They argue that animals have an intrinsic value similar or equal to that of the human person and that using them for food, clothing, or science recognizes in them only an instrumental value. The philosophical and ethical grounds of this position are weak. That animals have an intrinsic value, that they furthermore have rights, is difficult to prove. Animals have interests, but only human beings have rights because only they have duties. Again, the book doesn't really expand on the philosophical background to that. But let me just make a couple of remarks about that criticism of the, the approach that says that um, the biocentric approach, especially, but to some extent, ecocentrism that places um, the animal world in such a high um, status. Okay, so here are humans. On classical Christian moral teaching, humans have the most important moral status because human beings have uh, the ability to hold duties, to, to bear obligations and responsibilities. And as such, human beings also have certain rights or certain um, expectations that they can require of others. With regard to them. If you take the life of an innocent human, the law expresses this by saying you're in serious trouble, a capital offense, or if it's not premeditated or something like that, a, a long-term prison sentence, to do damage to beings in this circle, humans, is to do serious harm to the most important class of beings, morally speaking. Okay, there are other beings, though, on um, classical Christian moral teaching that have value. Okay, but not rights. Okay, rights is, the idea that animals have rights is kind of a novel contemporary innovation. Okay, and it still doesn't have a consensus in the culture. It's, it's still a very small minority of the culture that thinks that animals have rights. But classical Christian moral teaching is that animals have substantive value. And you can't just do harm to animals without serious consequences. Okay, and our law does express this as well. Um, I was thinking this morning as I was preparing the lecture of the case of the football player, the quarterback, Michael Vick, who got in trouble for uh, abusing dogs uh, in the dog fighting case and got sent to prison for a while. Okay, you can't just do harm to animals without some consequences, at least, in our culture. Okay, and beyond animals, there are other kinds of living beings. Okay, we'll just say other living things that don't have value, but they have worth. So, for instance, the trees out on Hookham Mall may not have value, but they have worth. You can chop down a limb from a tree out there and not face serious consequences, whereas you can't chop a limb off an animal or off a human without serious consequences. Okay, um, generally speaking, infractions or crimes against other living things tend to be property crimes, as the law treats them, but not crimes against beings deserving of dignity and respect because they have rights, or beings deserving of dignity and respect because they have value. Okay, so that might help you guys conceive a little bit of the way that the stewardship model tends to classify different kinds of beings. Let us turn to a case study now. Questions? Everybody good with this? Hope this is a good, uh, this is a big picture theory lecture today as we prep up for this mini module.
Give me just one minute. I realize I have not attached my wires to my laptop here. So this will just take a quick moment.